senior most editors. Weekdays at 8 a.m. Thanks for tuning in to the Mutual Fund Show. My name is Neeraj Shah and over the next 25 minutes we'll tell you all that you need to know about specific schemes. Remember the last couple of weeks we've been talking about how post the reclassification, recategorization, whatever you call it, uh, what are the different kind of equity schemes that are available and what are the different kind of debt schemes that are available. The next category is hybrid schemes. And if you are indeed an investor, whether a current investor or a potential investor into hybrid schemes, what do the new categories look like? What kind of categories are the best fits for you? Uh, very important to understand that and to talk about precisely that. Vishal Kapoor, CEO of IDFC, AMC and Harshwan Rungta of Rungta Securities with me on the show. Gentlemen, both of you, uh, thanks so much for taking the time out and joining in. Um, almost everybody who's come on the show, uh, the last previous two episodes as well, to talk about the different schemes have been talking about this being a really good move uh, so that you can compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges within different schemes. The question mark, Vishal, only is that uh, while that effort is lauded, yes, or laudable, yes, there still exists a large number of schemes uh, for an investor to choose from. Is that, uh, is, does that defeat the purpose or not quite? Not quite, I would say. I think uh, if you were to restrict the categories to be too narrow, it does bring in more simplicity, yes. But on the other side, it avoids or it restricts choice as well. Uh, so really the question is, you know, what is the right number of categories? And I think the attempt right now is to take largely the existing blocks or buckets of schemes that have already evolved over the many years and group them into something which is sensible, which is largely consistent. Now, it cannot be perfect, but it is largely there, I would say. So does it achieve the objective of simplifying life for the investor as well as the advisor who can then measure apple to apple? I think it does that quite re quite well. Okay. Your conversations with either the advisory community or the investors that you guys would be meeting, the larger ones, etc., are all of them happy or did, did they have a lot of doubts when they were talking about it? The reason I ask this to you is that we did this three-part series on the mutual fund show simply because a lot of queries came into us about what will happen to the portfolios post the reclassification. A lot of people were unclear. Did you guys face that kind of uh, a barrage of questions of sorts from your sets of investors too? So I think that depends on the specific fund house. In our case, we were lucky that we did not have so many funds that needed to be changed or merged, etc. We actually had hardly any any change at all. Oh wow! Uh, because we did not have a plethora of uh, of schemes that had sort of germinated over the period of time. Uh, so it really depends on you know did you have to change a lot of fundamental attributes or merge schemes or or you know or, or move them into a different category or strategy. In our case, really uh, not much of a difference. Uh, having said that, I think life does become very interesting for the advisor uh, also because for the investor, uh, even if there is no change in the fundamental attributes, the name may have changed. And suddenly if you are seeing a scheme or you are used to scheme, seeing a statement uh, with certain names, uh, the change of name may not be material for you, but it is disruptive in the sense. So as an example, uh, we had a, a very well-regarded scheme called IDFC Premier Equity, mm. uh, which has a new name called IDFC Multicap. So if you are a 10-year-old uh, statement and you've been seeing this as yeah, Premier, Premier Equity, equity. you see Multicap, Harsh would definitely get a call saying, look, you know what happened to Premier Equity? <laughs> It's the same scheme. So, you know, you just have to take the customers through that. But I think it's a matter of a few months before you get used to the new names. I guess so. So that's the question. In the hybrid category as well, Harshwardhan, I mean, did, uh, did were there many changes across the AMC houses or were they a lot lesser compared to, say, the equity schemes where I believe the number of changes have been fairly large as per what uh, experts were telling us? Uh, well, Neeraj, if you look at the intent, I mean, le let's understand how simple life has become post this apple-to-apple -apple comparison and specific, uh, you know, categorization being made. I'll just give you an example on equity as well. Now, every fund house earlier had their own, uh, you know, definition of large cap, mid cap and small cap. So every fund house would have their own internal guidelines based on, based on which they would classify a particular company as a mid cap or a large cap. 
Now, this actually was not the right con you know, context to compare two large caps also. You couldn't compare two mid caps because they had different definitions. Now, in this, even, uh, you know, they've come out with a list which actually says the top 100 companies, are these are the exact where True. these are the companies. Yeah. So, it becomes an apple to apple comparison. True. Now, look at the hybrid category, as you mentioned. So, hybrid essentially is what? It's a mix of two or three asset, uh, different assets. So that's a combination how you would, uh, you know, you could have different uh, combinations have a 10, 20 percent equity going up to say about 70, 80 percent equity. Or you could have multi-asset class, you could have three different assets uh, into one particular product. Yeah. So all this is hybrid. So as a category, it's very nice that it has been clearly specified to be hybrid. Now when you look at it, I mean they've got a category for every investor type. Now, so if I'm an investor, Okay, when I go and I say that I can take less risk, I do not want to take too much of risk. So I want a uh, hybrid product which is not very aggressive. So that is conservative in that nature. So there is a category mentions a conservative hybrid fund. And we'll come to that, yes. Yeah. So I think this classification is helping investors, helping advisors, as we just spoke about, the distributor fraternity also it becomes easier for everybody to put all these things in perspective. Okay, so let's talk about some of these categories. Let's uh, cut to the chase straight uh, and start off. Some of these might overlap as well because the differences might be minor. So I'll defer uh, that judgment to you guys. But Vishal, let's start off with the conservative hybrid front. I believe uh, uh, equity and equity related instruments about 10 to 25% and debt instruments about 75% to 90%. Right. Uh, what, I mean, what kind of uh, investors you reckon uh, would opt for such categories? What kind of returns can one expect from such a category? So this, if you relate back to the old name or the popular category that used to, you know, this is a new avatar of that. This used to be largely the monthly income category. Uh, so if, if you remember, you know, about a year back, the monthly income funds uh, or plans, MIPs, uh, was a popular category largely around people who are conservative mm. by nature, but do want some amount of equity just as a bit of an inflation hedge. It was very popular with people who were, let's say, retirees or had a lump sum, wanted stable returns, but wanted a bit more of equity uh, or, or, or a small amount of equity to beat inflation. Now, the name change from monthly income to conservative hybrid is very important because you don't want to give the impression that somehow there is a monthly income guaranteed or, a, or, or certain because this is a mutual fund, it carries market risk. So I think the name change to conservative hybrid is very appropriate. It's conservative because it has largely fixed income assets. Mm. Only 10 to 25% can be equity. Mm. It means it's largely a fixed income product with some amount of equity. Because of the allocation, it has fixed income taxation, which means that you do want to hold for at least three years for it to be more tax efficient. Uh, so great product for conservative people with a bit more bit of equity allocation if you, that's what you'd like to beat inflation. Interesting. Um, Harsh, uh so whether it's conservative hybrid or the next category, balance hybrid, and I believe in balance hybrid, the difference is that there is no arbitrage permitted in the scheme. Uh, what would be the kind of investors that you would believe from your client set that you would advise to get into these schemes? Uh, what would be the difference between these two? Yeah, so if you look at the allocation, it's about 40 to 60 percent either in equity or in debt. Hmm. Okay, so, uh, you know, this essentially is for individuals who are looking at asset allocation and more importantly, automatic rebalancing. So say for instance, we've advised somebody to have an asset allocation of 60% in equity, 40 in debt. Hmm. Now that allocation needs to be maintained even three years from now. Now what happens is, when you invested today, suppose you invested a lakh of rupees. So 60% has gone into equity, which is 60,000 and 40% in debt. Now after a year, you will see the valuations are going to be different. So equity may have gone up or down and debt may have performed either ways. We need to rebalance it again. So this exercise, if you're doing it on your own, suppose you put an equity fund and a debt fund, you would need to rebalance it on your own. Now, if you look at a balanced category, balanced hybrid, you could have one fund and the fund itself, the scheme itself would do that rebalancing. Because the mandate is, suppose if they're investing 40% in debt or equity, they will have to rebalance it at every point in time. So an investor who looks at asset allocation, doesn't want to get into that mode of doing it himself or herself, can possibly look at this. The risk profile, of course, will be moderate uh, to a little high because there is going to be an equity exposure to this. So this will be the investment, uh, you know, uh, the profile of the investor. Interesting. Average return expectations from so see, both of these schemes? If so at all. Quite, quite honestly, it has equity components. So mm. uh, unless you have a longer time span, you cannot really predict returns. Yeah, but let's say somebody wants to invest for three years. I'm, I'm not, I want to hold a gun to your head, yeah, but just a ballpark estimate. So it will be difficult to give you those kind of uh, uh, figures because of regulatory restrictions as well. Okay. Uh, but in any case, if you're looking at a hybrid product, you're going to stay invested for three years, five years and beyond. 
if you're not going to be able to make more than fixed deposits a fixed return instrument and you're not able to make a double figure return then you actually you're not doing the right thing you're not taking enough risk i mean you know to uh, to match the kind of xi exponential returns that you're getting okay. so expectation would be that you could get about uh, double figure returns at 10 11% depending on how the markets have spanned out but it is obviously over a little longer period of time equity market in the short term can be extremely volatile yeah and and which is why viewers uh, the constant refrain from the mutual fund show and the people who do it and and, and the people who come as guests as well if you are investing in mutual funds don't treat them as short term products kindly please please invest into mutual funds with a slightly long term perspective i think the amfi advertisements as well which are speaking about mutual funds sahi hai but thoda patience rakhna zaruri hai are are fairly potent examples of what you need to do when you're investing in funds the next category and that's the aggressive hybrid fund now uh, vishal do you reckon that this comes in for people who want a higher equity exposure but at the same time want to have that little bit of a safeguard or some bit of downside protection to their investments maybe for first timers who want an equity exposure would this be a good product it is and uh, clearly the investors have voted for this product category because this is the erstwhile balanced category uh, by and large the aggressive hybrid category is where the new old balance funds have chosen to go uh, into uh, so it's a large category it's popular because of the reasons that you mentioned which is largely equity but with a bit of stability coming in through fixed income the allocation range for this as defined is 65 to 80 Uh, so there is a reasonable amount of equity it's an equity overweight sort of a position but uh, again like harsh mentioned if you want to go with a 65 35 or a 70 30 sort of allocation then instead of doing it through two or three different products to achieve that uh, in a in a hybrid product you are achieving that same result while being more efficient because the fund manager is doing the rebalancing for you and you have just one nav that you can track so it yeah. makes life much simpler uh it does have the benefit of equity taxation again so that's the other benefit of this category any any reason why uh you know fund inflows in in this kind of funds you know i mean the popular wisdom of the last couple of months is that the balanced fund categories have seen a uh, remarkable uh dip in the kind of flows that were coming in as compared are coming in that compared to what used to be the case uh difficult to say to be very honest but i think a couple of reasons could be a bit more caution uh building up which mm. means that a slightly more conservative allocation than the 70 30 could be uh, uh you know the choice that investors are now making okay uh i i'd like to add here we've been interacting with a couple of investors on this particular topic i mean of why balanced fund had such kind of popularity in the last two years particularly so one of the things that we uh, we realized in several investor camps also that we did was that many of them were approached with this uh, thing of you know regular dividend yeah, being yeah. paid out on the balanced fund and with the introduction of the tax on dividend you know and capital gains now this in, you know this theory has a kind of undone itself yeah but which so is which is probably good i mean it was silly to uh, market i mean whoever did market that product like a monthly uh income product right is this uh, improper or inappropriate to do so, that in the first so, place so this e categorization exercise and the taxation implication have also kind of undone that bit of uh, in fact the <laughs> argument uh, that is often being made is that uh you know from a mutual fund you shouldn't be really using the term dividend hmm. because in some senses it is return of capital it's not a dividend uh, so we use the word dividend as similar to a company which is which is giving it out of profits here really it's part of your capital so whether you call it dividend or you call it some other name uh, it tantamounts to the same thing and we do therefore suggest that a systematic withdrawal plan hmm. is a far better way for an investor to get the cash flows that you want rather than a dividend because you know often what you don't see is that while you may be getting the dividend the capital may be getting eroded and you know it's better to know what you're stepping into and an swp is a far better far more tax efficient way to do that yeah, and, th- and both of you thanks for making this point it, it must be the 20th time that you're making this but uh, i i don't mind making this point for another 20 times because there's so many people who get misguided by this whole thing anyway uh, guys but the the next set of na- uh, names and um, harsh let me start off with you that dynamic asset allocation fund um, what's the what's the thought process here i mean i think uh, it's essentially that the equity or debt managed dynamically uh, what kind of investor should approach such schemes again historically what kind of returns would such schemes have given even if you don't want to predict the future returns uh, well see if you look at the dynamic asset allocation funds the underlying phenomena being at the matrix being that there is some parameter basis on which the fund manager will decide how much goes into equity and debt 
So that parameter could be the price to book, uh, you know, of the market. It could be the P ratios of the market. So if the fund manager or the fund house believes that the market are trading at an expensive P at an all-time high, they will reduce the equity exposure. And once the market corrects itself and they feel that this is a good rate, this is a good price, and the multiple to enter, they will increase the equity allocation. So the, the you know it's very fluid. The allocations are fluid. Now this is very good for people who believe that they want to be investing at a good value. So any investor who's a value conscious investor, like you know, see everything has a price. I've been saying this since a couple of times now. Uh, you know, however good a product is, it has a price tag, right? So you cannot buy something at three times its uh, actual or fair value. So similarly with markets, similar with good companies. Mm. So if anything goes beyond its logical levels, then there has to be a reduction in that allocation. So dynamic asset allocation funds actually serve that purpose. So any investor, if he has a lump sum, okay, so normally we fear that you know we don't want to invest a lump sum into the market because you know which side will go, etc. So in this case, this helps you in that context that you've parked your money in a lump sum and you'll be reasonably sure that the money is going to be invested in equity only if the markets permit, even if it's at a logical level. So yeah. any person looking, being a value conscious investor, looking to invest as a lump sum can, without fear, invest into a product like this. And obviously, because it has equity to whatever extent, you'd want to keep it for beyond three years. Hmm. From two, two, uh, two parameters, one, because it has certain equity exposure. The other part being that if the allocation in equities falls below 65%, it gets categorized as a debt fund. Yeah. And if it's a if it's a debt fund, then you would want to stay invested for three years at least. Yeah. So at least to take the long-term capital gains capital advantage. If I can just add a, a, a point on this, because this is my favorite category. In uh -huh. the, in Interesting. The hybrid. Why so? Uh, because I think uh, why most of the other products uh, take a very, in a sense, the manufacturer's view about allocation, which is you know 20, 80, 70, 30, etc. I think this category itself takes a very behavioral view around allocation. Now if you, and I think you know, you would have heard many investors talk about the fact that how come the funds make money and my portfolio doesn't make mm -hmm. the same money, etc. And we attribute it down to behavioral biases or issues, right? And what's the most common issue? The most common issue is that when markets are falling, everything in the environment seems very negative. It's very difficult, despite the best of effort for advisors to go out and tell you that, look, markets are cheap now, please put in more money into <laughs> equity, no one's buying, no one's buying. right? You're always looking for the bottom that will happen next week, or yeah. you know, you're going to pick the bottom, and often it's too late. And the reverse happens when, you know, when, when the market is getting euphoric, right? So it's always that, no, okay, this week is a new high, but next week will be even better. And there's a lot of uh, experts who will come and say, look, it's maybe touching, uh, you know, it's time to book profits, take some gains, you know, prune your exposures, if, you know, go back to your allocation, et cetera. It's just very difficult behaviorally to do that. This category, to my mind, is attractive because it automatically does what you should be doing. Yeah. So when markets are correcting, suppose you put in your 100 rupees initially, and let's say it went in with a 50-50 allocation, because that's how the P or the underlying model was. If the markets have corrected since then, the fund manager is automatically increasing your equity exposure. So you didn't have to do anything. He's doing what you should be doing yeah. without you having to you know, really bother about it. And vice versa. When the markets are getting cheaper, the fund ma managers are already in increasing your equity exposure and therefore giving you much better value. So over a cycle, on a risk-adjusted basis, this category really stands out. And in the way, for example, we've devi devised our product, which is the IDFC Dynamic Equity Fund, we take the active equity down to 30, but through the arbitrage strategies, your taxation still remains at equity levels. So you can have 30 active equity, 35 arbitrage, still qualifies for equity taxation at a very high market level. Mm. When the markets are cheap, active equity can go all the way up to 100%. So it's really giving you everything between an equity savings category and a full equity category through one fund. So over a cycle, I really do think this category stands out. Interesting. So wh what would um, then, and a bunch of queries, so we'll talk about, uh, <laughs> there are a couple of interesting questions uh, and we'll talk about them. But just wondering, the next category, which is the multi-asset allocation uh, category, which probably also takes in one more, I mean, three asset classes. 
what would the difference to your mind be between the dynamic asset allocation and multi-asset allocation? I know the difference is three asset classes versus necessarily two. But in terms of uh, the fund manager behavior or the return behavior, how would the changes be? So I think it is more just another category of funds. I mean, it's an option that is being available because you know we have a diverse set of investors with different requirements. So as a regulator, as a manufacturer, uh, you know, you need to provide everything that is available and the investor can pick and choose. So mm. we had one popular product which has a, which had gold as an allocation. Yeah. So you know which had equity, debt and gold. Now uh, you know some of uh, you know the intelligent one would think it's you know not related directly it's you know uh, you know all those kind of you know you can put those uh, you know ideas into this but the whole idea is that if you want to have an exposure into three asset classes which are pre-specified to you an investor could possibly look at it. I mean but if it's completely correlated or unrelated, then it's a different story altogether. But to my mind, I mean, I would not, uh, you know, unless I know which is the third product, which is uh, as a part of the asset, which is a part of this product, we would like to look at it in an independent basis rather than as a category and all. Yeah. So I guess uh, the suggestion would be any investor which looks at all the three categories, believes that he wants to just have one fund, which you know has all these uh, you know assets in one, then you could possibly look at it. Well, there is a gentleman who has got a query. Uh, this is on Facebook coming in from Rangaraj and Balakrishnan. And the reason I bring this query right now before we talk about some of the other asset classes is because his question has pertinence. <laughs> He's saying I'm completely puzzled on asset allocation on hybrid. Why should it standard be standard 40% and 60%, which I think is misinformation, by the way. But still, I ask the question: Why should it be standard 40% and 60%? And Part two of his question is, what would be the CAGR? Would it be greater than the inflation rate? Either of you, if you want to take this query. So uh, the 40 to 60, you mean the balanced? Uh, I, I guess yeah, he's right. looking at a particular category. But he maybe wants some other information. If there are other categories available, I think we yeah. discussed a couple of these. So I think, uh, see, there's a full range available now, which is uh, pretty much giving you all the allocations that you want, starting from the conservative hybrid, like we mentioned, at 10 to 25. Yeah. To, we've not covered the equity savings, but there's the we'll equity savings, which is also about 30, 35 or so. You know, there's a range there. Then there's a 40 to 60, hmm. and there's a 65 to 80. Right. So frankly, you've got the full range of allocations to one product, hmm. uh, depending on what your appetite or what your advice is. Uh, now, CAGR obviously depends on what the individual asset performance has been, uh, which depends on so many factors, including how long you've held it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So your CAGR will be what the underlying, uh, you know, markets have delivered. Yeah. Uh, historic performance is something we can quote, but like uh, Harsh mentioned earlier, you know, we don't want to hazard a guess a going guess. forward. Yeah, and but I, you know, I, I think the simple answer to your one, I mean, if I can uh, take the liberty of answering, there is, there is no one standard now. There are multiple categories available, so you can actually go out. Uh, see this show back if you want to and figure out what the categories each of the categories are and whether uh, those categories are suited for you because our guests have also explained what kind of investor should opt for what kind of categories so this might actually help you choose the category that you want and then the returns uh, commensurate for the same so the next category let me get to that and that's the arbitrage fund and harsh uh, can i come to you uh, for this uh, what kind of uh, investor should choose this fund who uh, again Historically, if you look at it, uh, would these returns beat inflation? I think that's what almost every investor who's now invested in a hybrid category wants to know. Yeah, so answering that query about uh, whether a hybrid category fund could beat inflation. Okay, that's you're answering first. that first. Okay. Because, you know, once sure. you get your mind clear on that part, you know, then we could possibly, why hybrid funds than otherwise? Sure, okay. I mean, so, you know, ultimately, whatever you do, whether you invest in a 100% debt fund or a 100% equity fund or anything in between, the idea is to generate returns. Sure. So how is a particular fund helping me to generate that return which I desire? So somebody desires a real wealth creation goes for a more equity exposure. Now why hybrid? Now hybrid, how does it have the capability to beat inflation? Okay, it's because there is a small portion of equity in it. Yeah. Debt has its own limitations. Sure. Okay, so debt, uh, unless you're looking at a scenario where there's a you know, continuous fall in interest rates and you know somebody has been able to capture that through the kind of duration that he has in his portfolio, it's not even going to help him. So debt has its own limitations, which you can assume is going to be a cost of capital plus extra that you're getting. Now, how do you gain that extra bit is when your economy does well. And that will translate into the profits of the underlying companies, which will give you extra returns in your portfolio. So there is a possibility of beating inflation. Only then would you go into a hybrid fund. Otherwise, would you take that per unit extra risk? Perfect. So answering that question now. Now comes to the arbitrage fund. Yes. Now arbitrage fund, again, the objective of an investor would be to generate returns. But because it's an arbitrage product, you cannot really expect an exponential return because it's not essentially investing into equities. 
It's a two-way position taken, which the profits are being booked already. And because of a preferred taxation on this, because it's an equity fund by nature, the long-term capital gains kick in after one year, and it's 10% of the gains that you make. And if you compare this with another product, which is a bank fixed deposit or any fixed interest instrument, that's going to be a three-year holding period with uh, taxation in a different manner. So this is essentially a replacement or I would say a, a comparable product rather than a replacement. It would be a comparable product to a fixed deposit kind of a uh, thing without a fixed coupon rate. A bank depositor knows that he's going to get an X rate. So this would be just another form and capturing the possibilities and the avenues of our arbitrage. Not necessarily all the time you have a good spread. So that also needs to be understood <laughs> very well. Uh, not only because it's a tax-friendly uh, tax product. So I think an investor which is who's looking at a you know a very stable return kind of a thing better than what a uh, bank fixed deposit will get possibly and a more tax friendly product. Interesting. Um, the, some of the last schemes uh, and I'll quickly run through them. You wanted to speak about the equity savings uh, scheme as well, Vishal. What are your thoughts here? I mean, again, I, I believe equity and related instruments about 65 odd percent if yeah, I'm not wrong. The difference here versus the balanced or the aggressive hybrid is that you can use arbitrage or equity related strategies but not really taking an active market position uh, in the equity savings category which means that the effective equity exposure you have is much lower may average about 30 35 percent uh, so therefore it's quite conservative in its nature but gives you the benefit of equity taxation therefore very tax friendly so what's the difference between this one and the first one that we started with conservative hybrid this is equity taxation takes a slightly higher active equity position versus mm -hmm. the 10 to 25, this might be 30, 35 or so, but is equity taxation. And otherwise, you know, quite, so it's, it's slightly higher in the grading that we discussed, which is, you know, you've got now four or five different categories of asset allocations, each with its own uniqueness. Uh, so while, yes, it does have on paper a 65 plus percent equity uh, weightage, uh, the active equity, which is how correlated to how exposed are you to the to the real market is much lower so it's a conservative product interesting solution oriented schemes uh, i believe a lock in of 5 years or till retirement uh, you want to come in on this either of you anybody i mean sure. okay so i think uh, solution oriented is clearly uh, you know for a person who has an objective in mind and it's a great great thing to have an objective for a saving or a goal for a saving and here's the two categories uh, where you can actually save or accumulate, uh, accumulate assets for a sp specific objective. And retirement and children's education tends to be the two large objectives that these two categories are, are catering for. Uh, the design here is that you have to hold on for five years or the achievement of that objective, typically if you're hitting retirement, right? Now, how is this beneficial? Because in, in one sense, because of the lock-in, you are, you know, it's sometimes good to be forced so that you meet the objective. Too much liquidity sometimes means that you can be indisciplined or therefore you can, you can liquidate. So it keeps you on track. The way some of the products in the market are designed is that it does allow you a life stage based allocation. So the allocation transitions as you get closer to your goal. So as an example, if I'm 30 and I'm accumulate, accumulating through a retirement plan, I can afford a more aggressive allocation when I start. But as I get closer to my retirement age, the allocation in the fund itself changes to become more conservative. So in a sense, in one product it's doing for me what multiple strategies underlying I would have to follow or through an advisor uh, try to achieve. Okay, and, and similar rules I reckon for children's fund as well, so not too much of a difference I would presume between the two. Again, a lock-in and therefore better allocation, so on and so forth. We're running slightly short of time, so I'm rushing through the next two categories, and Harsh, if I can come to you. Yep. The index of ETF funds, would you want to dwell in on this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, index funds have been extremely popular in the developed markets because of uh, the information dissemination processes, etc. But in our country, and in India right now, it's still at a nascent stage, I would say. I mean, the popularity still needs to pick up because we have seen fund managers beating the index quite a bit. Now, with the TRI and the PRI being differentiated, now comparing to TRI, we have spoken about this earlier. Yes. So, uh, now when we start seeing the benchmarking to TRI and the outperformance, then you will possibly see the value that the fund manager is adding. So going further, I believe there's going to be a lot of uh, emphasis on ETFs. And uh, as we get becoming a progressive country and developed markets, I mean, we will see the information dissemination coming real time. 
So the benefits, how is somebody going to take this and going to use it to its advantage? Any particular actively managed scheme or no? So ETFs will be a very, very prominent product going further mm. because of the cost efficiencies as well. So an investor who wants to take a call but doesn't want to, you know, who wants to invest his money but doesn't want to really depend on the choices made by a fund manager, ETFs is a natural choice. Yeah. I and mean, you participate in the growth of the country, you and it's easy to track. I mean, it's simple. If the, if the index is going up, you just have to see what the index has done. Yeah. And you know that similar reflection is going to be on your fund. Yeah. And uh, when you talk about the fund of funds or international funds, well, these are for a slightly well-informed investor because they would actually want to know and diversify. If you're talking about international funds, you're talking about geographical diversification. So if you're investing in a US market, a European or an emerging Asian market, so you would want to take a call specifically. Like uh, sitting here in India, I cannot really pick and invest into the best companies of US. But if I want to do that, I can most certainly allocate a portion of my money. Don't get into the LRS system and you know just park my money the way I do in regular mutual funds and my money actually gets invested overseas. So it's for a well-informed investor having understood this properly. And it is for a slightly, as I said, it has to be well-informed. You can't, you can't just look at the past returns and go about doing it. Yeah. Because the, we've seen the international funds doing very well right now. But that's primarily because of dollar appreciating. Yeah, well, interesting. You know, uh, Morningstar, of course, has rated a few top performing funds as per the new categories as well. And Jesh Kilani has all the details. Jesh. Neeraj, uh, first and foremost, uh, out of all the categories that we have, uh, not many of them actually have uh, funds under them or, uh, you know, uh, Morningstar ratings. So there's some few examples that I have uh, chosen for you, uh, which is the aggressive allocation is the first category that we are talking about. And the LNT hybrid fund in particular, that has a four-star rating or as per Morningstar. And over the last five years has returned in excess of 16% on a compounded basis under the aggressive allocation category. If you move on, to the other category which is uh, the conservative allocation and the example that we have is Aditya Birla Sun Life Regular Savings Fund which is a five star rated fund on Morningstar and a uh, five year CAGR of just over 11.5%. Uh, the third category that we have is the dynamic asset allocation and uh, uh, you know one of the favorites of the guests as well so icici prudential balance advantage fund uh, features over here which is a four star rated uh, morning star by morning star and has a five year cagr of just over 13 percent Lastly, we have uh, one more category, which is the equity savings category. And the H HDFC equity savings fund is the example that we have with a five-star rating as per Morningstar and a five-year CAGR of just about 9.25%. Just to give you a sense of you know, uh, the various categories that we have and historically how these funds have actually performed. Thanks a lot for that. A standard disclosure, these aren't recommendations made by Bloomberg Quint. It's essentially Morningstar recommendations which we are presenting to you uh, and not uh, and chosen uh, really on a random basis and not really uh, a specific selection being made. I have one last question. Uh, Harsh, you will have to necessarily come in on this. I don't know if you can give an answer to that or no. Oops, where did it go? Okay, there's a query that has come in uh, from Sai Krishna and is asking about what are the views on HDFC hybrid equity fund? Do you have a thought here? Yeah, so as a fund house, or, you know, this any store, any selection of schemes, I mean, many investors do ask this, how do you go about picking up a scheme? So you need to look at the pedigree of the fund house. So we're talking about good fund houses like an HDFC and the top 10, 11 fund houses. They are really good in, their, in what they do. So HDFC is a fund house, it's a yes. Now you look at the hybrid equity fund, they have been performing very well. The performance across different market cycles has been nice and has been good. So naturally, I mean, there is no harm in picking up a, a fund like that. Interesting. My last question, Vishal. Uh, you mentioned at the uh, sometime in the show that uh, a category was your favorite category, which is, I believe, the dynamic asset allocation, if I'm not wrong. Uh, would you go as far as saying that you would not mind investing your own money into that category of funds? I would say as far to go, I have invested my own money in that fund because I do think it's a great category across cycles. Uh, so it saves me the bother of you know, trying to track the market so closely for my own personal investments. Uh, it also gives you a balance of fixed income and equity, which over a cycle, I think, uh, is a sensible thing to do. Uh, and our fund has done very well. So congrats to the fund manager. One point I do want to bring up is that with the categorization for viewers as well as advisors, I think one of the challenges that the industry faces is that where there have been scheme mergers or changes in fundamental attributes, uh, you have to watch out for past performance because some of those performance may not be really replicable in the future because the strategy underlying has changed, although the label or the name has not changed. Uh, so that's something that I guess uh, one needs to keep in mind 
which makes the, the job of the independent researchers and Harsh and, and all the, uh, I think, advisors a bit more complex going forward. Yeah, well, um, only adds to the complexity and which is why we say that mutual funds are not as simple as they seem. They're simple to invest in, but if you want to invest well, maybe just maybe take a help of a financial advisor in order to make uh, uh, better returns over a period of time. But gentlemen, thank you so much for joining in today and giving us your thoughts. Really appreciate your time. And viewers, thanks for tuning in to the Mutual Fund Show.